Hello, I'm Peter Van Dusen, and this is Primetime Politics, the campaign edition. It is day two of the federal election campaign. Canadians will go to the polls on September 20th. Today, the campaign was dominated by questions about mandatory vaccines, economic and childcare plans, and also uh, lots of discussion about Canada's response to the crisis in Afghanistan. Coming up, candidates will debate all of those latest developments and we'll take a closer look at efforts to improve the diversity of candidates by encouraging more black Canadians to run for elected office. But first, the day on the campaign trail. The Conservative leader campaigned again today from a party television studio in an Ottawa hotel. Aaron O'Toole unveiled the party's detailed election platform with the T-shirted leader on the cover. It promises billions in new spending to rebuild the economy, with a pledge to recover the one million jobs lost during the pandemic, with additional financial supports for women, young people and small business, a guaranteed annual 6% increase in funding to the provinces for health care, and a domestic vaccine industry. The plan, which has yet to be costed by the parliamentary budget officer, also promises to scrap the Liberal plan to create a $10 a day childcare plan and replace it with a 75% tax credit for childcare expenses. We will look to, 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 to parents to make the best decisions and our, our plan is very ambitious because we do need to help families get back on their feet. We do need to see the, the losses for women in the workforce uh, regained. This will help do it. O'Toole also faced more questions about his position against mandatory vaccines. The Conservative leader says vaccinations are a personal health issue. He favours rapid testing instead. We have a reasonable and effective approach that respects Canadians and keeps people safe. It's not the time to divide, it's the time to work together to fight COVID-19 together. The Liberal leader toured a label-making company in Longueuil, Quebec, before promising additional supports for businesses trying to deal with the ongoing impacts of the pandemic. A re-elected Liberal government will extend and introduce new emergency supports for businesses and workers to make sure we build back better for everyone. And that starts with good middle-class jobs. To get more people back to work, we'll extend the Canada Recovery Hiring Program until March 31st, 2022. Justin Trudeau also attacked the Conservative leader over his reluctance to support mandatory vaccines for federal workers and federally regulated travel such as airlines and trains. It is unfortunate, uh, but it is typical of a, of a party that has said that we shouldn't be uh, helping Canadians as much as we did during this pandemic. Uh, and uh, is proposing to roll back so many of the protections and investments that have made us the world leader on vaccinations and on uh, economic recovery. The NDP leader supports mandatory vaccines. In fact, Jagmeet Singh says he wants to see mandatory vaccines and vaccine passports in place by Labor Day. With the fourth wave that looks like it might be upon us and, and kids going back to school, we can't afford not to act. We need to mobilize every resource possible to say, if we want to protect kids, one of the most important things that experts are saying is that we need to make sure all adults are vaccinated. And to do that, at the federal level, we can set some leadership. We can ensure that all federally regulated workers and, and federal workers directly are vaccinated by that date, by, by Labor Day. The NDP leader campaigned in Toronto today on his promise to claw back money from any company that received government pandemic supports and then went on to increase bonuses for executives or pay out dividends to shareholders. Why is it that Justin Trudeau continues to let the richest companies get away with abusing the system? It's exactly that approach that has allowed billionaires to continue to earn so much while people struggle. The Bloc Québécois leader campaigned in Quebec City, and he's been musing about winning an additional eight seats in Quebec for a total of 40. He also weighed in on mandatory vaccinations. Yves-François Blanchet saying the federal government has no authority to impose mandatory vaccines on federally regulated workplaces in the provinces. The jurisdiction about how to control and make sure that everybody is getting a vaccine is a Quebec jurisdiction. And Green Party leader Annamie Paul campaigned in Toronto today where she unveiled the party's climate plan. We are the only party in Canada that has said clearly no new pipeline projects, no oil and gas exploration, no fracking. 
the only party. And that's the kind of day it's been, day two of the federal election campaign. So mandatory vaccinations and economic plans dominate the campaign today. Let's follow up with three candidates in this election. Karina Gold is the Liberal candidate and incumbent MP for the riding of Burlington. She's also Canada's Minister of International Development. John Barlow is the Conservative candidate and incumbent MP in the Alberta riding of Foothills. And Don Davies is the NDP candidate and incumbent MP in the BC riding of Vancouver Kingsway. Good to see you all. Um, look, I, I want to begin with the issue of mandatory vaccinations. I want to start with uh, John Barlow here. Uh, let me start with you, John. Uh, your leader says he doesn't support mandatory vaccinations and opposes uh, the federal plan to force all federal workers and workers in federally regulated companies for, uh, uh, to get those uh, mandatory vaccinations. And people who want to take planes or take trains, they, they would be forced to get vaccinated too. Uh, Aaron O'Toole says he prefers choice and more rapid testing. Why do you believe that's a better approach? Well, I think there's no question that vaccines are an option that, uh, that Canadians who want the vaccine should take, uh, take advantage of. Um, but this is private health information, and no Canadian should be forced to provide that private information to, to any uh, authority. Um, and no other workplace would, we, would the federal government demand uh, that, uh, that their employees take this kind of uh, step especially when there are other options like rapid testing, uh, like uh, testing uh, at, at, the, at the office mm. or, or before getting on a transit, having that, that negative test result with you before you enter the workplace or get on a plane so, or, or a train. Those options are available. So how would you deal with the questions that some people might have about their own safety? Those people who have been vaccinated, what rights should they have to be protected from those people who won't get vaccinated? Well, we have to go, you know, a year ago, if we had said that we would have be at 70% vaccination rate in Canada, we would have been ecstatic. And we've exceeded that. And uh, all Canadians should uh, be, be pleased with that result. But there's never going to be zero cases, Peter. We're going to have this ongoing. And there's going to have to be, um, you know, steps taken to understand that, that we're never going to have 100% Canadians vaccinated. We're never going to have zero cases of COVID. Okay. And, and this is going to be a fact of life for a very long time. And some precautions are going to have to be taken, like rapid testing, and people have those negative test results. All right, Karina Gold, the Liberals uh, are being accused uh, by Conservatives of making vaccines a wedge issue in this campaign. Uh, why is it right to force the people who either work for the federal government, who have jobs in companies regulated by the federal government, to get vaccinated? Well, look, we know that there is one way to tackle COVID-19 to the ground, and that's through vaccination. And we can be very proud of Canadians. I mean, over 80% of eligible Canadians have gotten vaccinated. But we also know there are still 15 to 20 percent of people who could get vaccinated who aren't getting vaccinated. And if we are going to get back to a more normal way of life, if we're going to get our economy back on track, we know what the solution is, and that's getting vaccinated. And so whether it's people who work uh, for the federal government or who are flying on planes or going on trains where there are mass groups of people, we want to get our economy back on track. Getting vaccinated is the absolute best way to do it. And I think it's really unfortunate that conservatives aren't getting on board with this because we know what we can do to protect if, the economy and to protect people's if, if lives. It, if it's a privacy and a rights issue, for instance, for those people who choose not to get vaccinated, but the federal government is making it a condition of employment or of travel for those industries it regulates, why not make it mandatory for all Canadians? Well, the federal government has jurisdiction over federally regulated industries. The provinces have jurisdiction over provincially regulated industries. We've seen that Quebec is moving forward with mandatory vaccination, um, and several other provinces are looking at that. There are conversations happening here in Ontario um, about education and healthcare workers. But what we can do at the federal level is what we're proposing to do, and hopefully that's a point of leadership for other jurisdictions to okay. look to here in Canada. Mr. Dave these new Democrats are uh, not only on side with the idea of vaccine passports and mandatory vaccines uh, for those federally regulated workers. Uh, the NDP says, look, it, it should all happen. Uh, passports and mandatory vaccines should happen by Labor Day. Uh, talk to me about the urgency here. Well, um, again, the NDP does agree with this policy. And, and in fact, we, we have challenged the government to, to basically put into action what they, they say they are they want to do by putting an urgency to the situation by Labor Day. Uh, John, I think, referred to vaccines as an option. Vaccines are more than an option. They're the pathway to us uh, defeating COVID-19. 
And uh, you referred, Peter, to the concept of forced vaccination. Nobody's talking about forced vaccination. We are talking about incentivizing vaccinations, and we're talking about there being consequences uh, if people choose not to get vaccinated. Um, you know, we now are talking about herd, herd uh, immunity of about 90% that is required to beat the Delta variant. So uh, we're at 80%, as Karina said, we've got to get that up to 90%. And let's face it, it's to protect vulnerable Canadians. Their children in this country under the age of 12 are not immunized right. and they're very vulnerable. And so someone has to think out for the public health of those people. And I think asking people to do their part and get vaccinated is important. And if, they're, if people choose not to, uh, nobody's gonna force them to, but there may be consequences to keep the general public okay safe and I think that's a wise public health policy. Let me go back to you Mr. Barlow you you talked a, a bit earlier saying look we're all there's always going to be COVID but isn't there going to be less COVID the more people are vaccinated? Well you know to, to Don's point that this isn't forced vaccination well what's the difference if I'm going to be fired from my job if I don't have a uh, vaccination? A mandatory vaccination is as close to force as, as the definition uh, could be and and there are you know, the, the, we've seen this goalpost move from 70% for herd immunity to 80. Now they're saying 90. And, and Don would know that when we were at the health committee, we didn't have uh, experts from Health Canada, from PHAC. None of them supported mandatory vaccination. In fact, they said quite the opposite. Uh, absolutely, um, vaccinations are an option for the Canadians who want them, and they should have that. But there also should be a choice. Canadians have rights. And those should also be an important part of this conversation. Karina Gold, what happens to those federal employees who choose not to get vaccinated? Uh, will they face firing or will they face, uh, uh, you know, being moved to a, uh, a, a working from home? Or what if they say, no, I'm not getting vaccinated, even though your rules say I have to? I think all of those conversations are underway, but I think as Don pointed out, I mean, the reason why we are for this kind of policy is to protect those who are vulnerable. Any parent with a child under the age of 12 is very concerned right now about them because they're not eligible to be vaccinated. And so people always have a choice, but we also want to be incentivizing those to get vaccinated. And that's why this conversation is underway. It's why the prime minister has asked the clerk of the Privy Council to explore it. It's also why it's going to take a little bit more time to implement to make sure that for those people who, for example, are unable to get vaccinated, that there are exemptions in place. And it's also a reason why we're doing it, to protect them for that small percentage of the population who is simply unable to get vaccinated. Okay. We all have a choice to protect others. And this is a really important way that we can all participate in the fight against COVID-19. Mr. Davies, the, the Conservatives aren't insisting that their, their candidates be vaccinated. Should uh, people ask at the door uh, when you people are doing your job in an election campaign, if you're doing uh, much door-to-door -door campaigning, and we'll see how the how the, uh, the campaign unfolds, should they be asking candidates if they've been vaxxed? Well, it's a fair question uh, for, for anybody to ask. I think, uh, you know, we've just been through the biggest global pandemic. We're in the middle of a, the biggest global pandemic in 100 years. And uh, uh, I think people have a right to know how safe they are. You know, in, in a few short weeks, we're going to be sending kids back to school. You know, John talked about uh, forcing people. I think parents want to know if their teacher is vaccinated or not before they send their, you know, their 10-year-old child into that classroom. Um, in long-term care centers, this, this country was decimated by, by COVID-19. We had the highest death rate proportionally of any country in the OECD. Uh, I, I think we want to know that our seniors and our parents and our grandparents are safe. Uh, I think it's reasonable to have healthcare workers be vaccinated. And to your question, Peter, about protecting the rights, uh, we have established law in this country for many decades that uh, where it's a bona fide occupational requirement to have a rule like this, uh, employers can do so. Mm. And then employees who choose not to get vaccinated can, uh, they have a duty to be accommodated to the point of undue hardship. And I think we, we can find that balance and protect rights and also public health and safety in this country. We've done it for decades. We, got, we have right. to do it now. Let me switch gears here. Mr. Barlow, your leader unveiled the Conservative platform today, an economic platform with a pledge to uh, spend uh, billions more to support uh, families and businesses during the pandemic. And a key component is a pledge to scrap the Liberal plan for $10, uh, $10 a day childcare and replace it with tax credits. That plan's already been negotiated with, I think it's eight provinces now, some of them conservative uh, provinces with conservative governments, and you want to replace it with tax credits. Why do you think that's a better approach? 
Well, I think there's a, a couple of things to that point. And first off, you know, the Liberals have promised a child care plan since, uh, you know, the early 90s and have failed uh, to ever actually follow through with it. And part of the reason is that they make all these grandiose announcements and all this funding, but it's all contingent on the provinces signing on to be partners in that. And certainly, uh, many cases, the provinces don't do that for a variety of reasons. A, they can't afford it. Uh, B, they don't want a made in Ottawa child care solution that is going to be, you know, a nine to five type option where we know in most cases that is not realistic for Canadian families who are doing shift work or you know, farming and ranching or uh, they want a neighbor or grandfather, or grandmother or, or a relative to take care of their kids. They need something that works best for them. So I think that's why this program, uh, I believe why this program is much more effective, where it puts the control back in the hands of the parents to make the decision that's best for their family, not uh, a program that's enforced uh, from Ottawa and an Ottawa knows best. Okay, uh, Karina Gold, the Prime Minister also promised new emergency supports or extended ones for hard hit businesses, but let's focus on, on the childcare uh, uh, promises and, and the, the debate now between tax credits versus direct government spending on childcare. Uh, this is now a clear point of differentiation between Liberals and Conservatives in this campaign. Uh, why do you think the Liberal approach is better than tax credits? Well, look, so first of all, Peter, I mean, this is Harper 2.0. I mean, the you know, again, Aaron O'Toole saying that, you know, actually Ottawa does know best. Uh, that's what he's saying. And making something that eight, eight provinces and territories have signed agreements with, with the federal government that will look to have the cost of child care for families living in those eight jurisdictions um, within the next you know year and then get to ten dollars a day I mean this is huge for families you know as a mother with a child in daycare I know the astronomical cost that that this is and we've seen over the past year how important child care is to the economy this is a winner for children it's a winner for families and it's a winner for the economy and it's so unfortunate that the conservatives still don't get this. Um, so look, I'm I'm disappointed. I'm not surprised because I think we could all see it coming. But this is we've seen in Quebec that when Quebec instituted their uh, universal daycare program, women's economic participation skyrocketed, and we're going to see that right across the country. All right, let me Families need this, and we are moving forward with it with eight agreements signed on the dotted line. All right, Don Davies, where's the NDP on, on uh, I, I know the NDP uh, sub, uh, supports uh, a national child care plan, wants a national child care plan. Uh, which is the better of the two options uh, being offered by these other two parties? Well, as you said, Peter, the NDP has been championing uh, universal access to quality, affordable child care for decades. In fact, in 2015, it was our flagship. Uh, platform commitment in 2015. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's funny, Karina just said this is Harper 2.0. This sounds to me like Paul Martin 1.5. Uh, you know, the Conservatives don't believe in affordable universal child care. The Liberals talk about it always, funny enough, at election time. It's always a dream deferred with the Liberals that they're, they're going to do this, just have to hang on. Well, they had six years. They've been in power since 2015. Uh, the Liberals have to bring this in. And here we are just signing agreements on the eve of a 2021 election. So I, I agree with Karina. Child, uh, child care, affordable quality child care is an essential component of a modern economy. Uh, families across this country depend on it. It's good for children. It's good for uh, participation in the workforce. And, and we have to have it. But if you want child care in this country, you got to elect more NDP MPs to get there to make sure it okay. happens. Let, let's finish on this. And I'll, I want to start with Karina Gould here. Um, and, and let's talk about Afghanistan. Um, Canada is now facing a real challenge to help Afghans who helped Canada when troops were deployed there, uh, interpreters, uh, drivers, others, trying to help them get to Canada with the Taliban now in, in control of the country. Uh, my question is that Joe Biden announced that in, in April the U.S. troops were being pulled out. And I, a lot of Canadians are wondering why it's taken so long for this country to put into action a plan to try and save those Afghans. Well, look, the situation in Afghanistan has deteriorated much faster than any of us anticipated. You know, the conversations that we were having on Wednesday versus Friday 
were completely different. Um, and of course, with the scenes that we're seeing now out of Kabul, I mean, our, our hearts are absolutely with people in Afghanistan, and it's just devastating to see. We have so far been able to evacuate over 800 uh, people from Afghanistan, and we will continue to so long as the conditions remain safe to do so. Uh, we have been working with uh, people who have supported uh, the Canadian government, uh, Canadian armed forces, Canadian development work uh, to try and register them and get them processed as quickly as possible. And we are really hoping um, that through the good work that's happening right now, uh, that we will be able to secure the conditions to continue to evacuate people. Mr. Barlow, what's, uh, what's your assessment of how the Canadian government has responded to the crisis in Afghanistan? Well, I think, uh, Peter, it's been a complete failure. Um, now, for Ms. School to say, you know, from Wednesday to Friday, things the things deteriorated. We've known for weeks uh, the situation that was going to un, uh, unravel in, in Afghanistan, certainly when the United States announced that they were going to be withdrawing uh, their troops. And for weeks, Canadians and the Conservatives have demanded uh, the federal government do something about evacuating those interpreters, those Afghan uh, citizens who helped Canadian forces for, for many years. And to say that we're hoping and, uh, you know, things remain safe, that we can pull people out. Uh, that's not good enough. Uh, they've known about right. this situation for weeks. Uh, you've seen the photos. And to leave the Afghan people, and those who have helped Canadians, uh, leave them to their own devices at the hands of the Taliban is simply not acceptable. All right, let me hear a, uh, get a final word from you on this, Mr. Davies. Well, I think there's a larger question about the uh, that speaks to the failure of successive liberal and conservative governments in Afghanistan after decades of, uh, of, of sacrifice and, and, and paid with Canadian lives and billions of dollars. Here we are in 2021 with the Taliban asserting, uh, you know, dominance over that country. I think that's a larger question. But I think what everybody agrees on is we have a moral, a deeply moral obligation to every single Afghani who fought for human rights, who, who risked their own lives to assist Canadians. And we are not doing as good or a fast a job okay. as we we can to get those people out. And by the way, it's another reason why this election should not be called right now. We have important issues to deal with, like chaos in Afghanistan and climate crisis and wildfires. Uh, right. Canadians don't need this un, un, unnecessary uh, vanity election okay. for okay. Justin Trudeau. All right. Uh, Karina Gold, John Barlow, Don Davies, uh, thank you all for your time uh, tonight. Appreciate it. And uh, good luck to all of you. Take care. Thank you, Peter. Thanks, thank Peter. Peter. Good luck, everybody. Federal political parties are once again facing criticism for not doing enough to recruit diverse candidates, in particular, black candidates. So far, there are fewer black candidates in this election than in 2019. And right now, there are just six of the 338 MPs in the House of Commons who identify as black and three appointed senators. Operation Black Vote Canada has been working to elect more black people to office at all levels of Canadian politics. The chair of the organization is Velma Morgan. I spoke with her earlier. Velma Morgan, first of all, thanks for making time to speak with me today. I do appreciate it. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, tell me, first of all, about Black Vote Canada and the role your organization plays in the democratic process. Operation Black Vote Canada is a not-for-profit, uh, multi-partisan organization. Um, and we're dedicated to educating, motivating uh, Black Canadians to be civically engaged, either uh, through volunteering on election campaigns, voting, and especially running for elected office at all three levels of government. So is the ultimate aim here to, uh, to have more uh, black Canadians as candidates in things such as uh, the federal election we're seeing here? Is, what, what's the objective here? Our objective is to have more um, black Canadians representing us at the decision-making tables at all three levels of government, um, in cabinets, um, in the opposition. We just want to be at every decision-making table so we could have a role in influencing policy. Uh, so are, are you in the recruiting business? Well, we don't, we don't recruit, but we encourage. We encourage Black Canadians to put their, um, their name on a ballot, and we will help them in terms of um, we provide training and workshops um, for them to learn how to get through the nomination process or to run a successful candidate, uh, campaign, especially if they're running at the municipal level. And to be clear, you touched on it, your organization is uh, looking to encourage black candidates, uh, you know, for all political parties, right? This is not, you're not uh, siding with one party here. Not at all. We, we encourage and we need black Canadians to be at every decision-making table, every particular party, because having representation in different political parties will help us to influence different policies that the party might be able to um, 
to carry out or their platform. How many black candidates have been nominated so far for this federal election? Uh, to date, as of yesterday, 30 black candidates have been nominated uh, federally out of 338 ridings. Uh, how does that number compare to the last election? Compared to 2019, 2019, we had uh, about 40, 43 candidates. So it's gone down. Um, we're extremely disappointed because we understand um, from what we've been told is that, you know, they want to have more uh, diversity within caucus. And in order to have diversity within caucus, you have to have uh, diversity in candidates, um, especially black candidates in winnable writings. Why do you think the number is lower this time than last time? Um, I don't know. I think that's something that you have to ask the political parties. We've encouraged them to um, to nominate more black people in winnable writings. In fact, we wrote a letter in May to all the political parties and leaders asking them to not only run black candidates in winnable writings, but also to help to support them in their election process. Uh, we only received um, a response back from one to look up from the Green Party. The other three parties did not respond to our um, to our letter. Mm. So we're hoping they saw the letter, and we're hoping that you know there's still time to nominate um, black candidates. It's late, but there's still time to nominate more black candidates. What's the biggest challenge faced by black people who have an interest in in vying for public office, but uh, may not uh, know about know, know exactly how to put that interest into action? What's the biggest challenge? Access. Um, so if you go on to their websites, um, they don't really tell you the steps to take if you want to be nominated. I think there's one political party that has step by step, but all the other parties, you don't even know who to call or who to talk to if you're not politically engaged and you want to run for their particular party. Uh, you know, it's one thing so, to be, it, yeah, it's, it's, it's one thing to be nominated as the candidate. It's, it's another to be nominated in a riding where uh, the chances of winning are high. Uh, how well have the political parties done in nominating black candidates in winnable ridings? Um, not that well. Um, I think this time around, there's a, there's a, a few that have a great a, a greater chance of winning because um, they the, the incumbents were liberals, so the chances that it might be another liberal, it might be an, another liberal candidate that, that will win. But you know, a lot of parties just like to do a check mark. You know, we have a black female check check, and mm -hmm. there you go. There's our you know we, we've tried, um, and that's not good enough for us. There is a, a there's an ongoing reckoning in this country over systemic racism. Uh, talk to me about the challenge of trying to convince or encourage black people to invest themselves in a process that many may believe discriminates against them and, and where they don't see themselves. Right. So, you know, as you know, there's probably the saying, uh, you can't be what you don't see. Um, and that's where we're encouraging um, black Canadians to run. That is why we, you know, we, we provide these workshops for them uh, to run. And we try to dismissify the process. Um, yes, it is a hostile environment. We've seen, you know, people leave um, the political environment because it is too hostile for them. But we're, we're still hoping that once we have more black people running, the environment um, will change. Um, we know that these institutions were not created to include us. Um, so for us being in there, we need to be able to change the way um, these institutions work. And we can only do that if we're there. I mean, is there another way to go about this, I'm wondering, uh, you know, to, to in some ways, at least in the first instance, to, to, to somewhat bypass the political parties? And I, let me get to the, the point I'm making. The commission that runs elections in Nova Scotia recently actually hired an outreach officer to encourage more participation from the black community. How useful would it be for Elections Canada, for instance, to consider that same approach? Right. So... It depends. Are we talking about, you know, um, black Canadians running or black Canadians voting? I think they hire that hire that commission for, for the community to go out and vote. Mm -hmm. And that would be great. That's something that I think, you know, perhaps um, maybe Elections Canada should hire um, across the country um, to encourage us to vote. Um, a lot of times we don't vote because we're thinking, what are we voting for? We don't see ourselves represented there. Um, so... Why should we? Why should we vote? It's the same type of politics. Um, so yes, um, for a commission for helping our community to go out and vote, but also I think you know we need to change the environment to have elected officials there, black elected officials. Mm. All right, um, Velma Morgan, thanks so much for your time today. Do appreciate it. Uh, we'll see if that number of thirty nominated candidates so far, uh, you know, gets higher as the as the campaign goes along. Not all nominations are complete, uh, so we'll see where we end up. But thanks for your time today. Thank you for having me.
That's all the time we have for this campaign edition of Primetime Politics. I'm Peter Van Dusen from all of us here at CPAC. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time. Thank you.